Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Epic Fantasy Romance. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Hmm. <sighs> Today is Tuesday, February 28th, last day of February 2023. Uh, what, what can we say? Um, two months down already. Uh, hope that you're all being productive and uh, that it feels good to be at this point uh, moving into spring. I've been seeing lots of people referencing spring. Comes up on the uh, suggested emojis on Instagram for what that's worth. <laughs> but I know I'm ready for a little spring. I almost sat outside again today. Uh, but it looks a little bit breezy. I didn't try it. The wind sculpture is spinning. So, and it's not all that warm. So unless I get that perfect level of sunshine and no wind, it doesn't work. So I spent all day yesterday working on the amethyst job, incorporating comments from my uh, three critique readers. I was amused by the comments that some of you sent my way, uh, empathizing on various points. Uh, yeah, it was a long day. I put in a long day um, longer than I normally do. I'm feeling lately like I need to push myself more. <laughs> and I know some of you out there are rolling your eyes at me, but, but hear me out. Um, well, yesterday I did five hours of revision work with one hour breaks between. And I was doing some pretty concentrated work. So it was good. I made it through all 100 pages. I mean, I wasn't drafting, which I feel like takes a different kind of mental and creative energy. But still, I could do the, the five hours of work. And I'm just starting to feel like I was tired when I was done, but I wasn't completely wiped out. Now, it wasn't Monday. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> hmm, maybe I am <laughs> a little wiped out now. It was a Monday, which means I've had a couple of days of rest. And that does make a difference. We'll see how I do today. I do need to spend another day on it. I have to make one more pass. Um, yesterday, I went through, you know, basically went through everybody's track changes and tweaked in places and did a bit of adjusting. Uh, I'm still working out the monetary system. I asked my, my friend Alex, who is the financial wizard, was one of my readers and gave me comments on the, the book and had tweaks in various places. So I started trying to keep track of, you know, like the coins and, and, and he's funny because he's like, I'm adamant this is what it should be. And I'm like, fine, because I actually don't care. I have no opinion on this. I just want it to make sense. And uh, so finally, later in the day, I said, okay, so <laughs> let me just clarify. If this many silvers is worth this many colds and, and all that, is is that right? And, and he's like, what? <laughs> he says, no, let me just lay it out for you. <laughs> it's like, thank you. Thank you. Just just do that. Um, reader, I am good at math. I, you know, I was in advanced math in school. I, I'm not a math idiot, but some of these, uh, I don't know. It, he was kind of wanting to get into like what the exchange rates would be between the human and pharaohs, and I drew the line at that. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. So, anyway. I have to make sure that all the references to money are clear. And there's one more thing I need to weave in. I did a little bit of naming yesterday as well, which is actually kind of fun. I needed to come up with a couple of names and I'm pleased with what I did. Uh, they were things that I had left unnamed uh, in the story and people wanted a little bit more detail on those things. So, and one of them, I'm going into the weeds on this because I, I think some of you might be interested because I do get a lot of questions about my revision process and it's um, not as easy to explain 
revision process, I think, as it is drafting, because drafting, it could say, you know, whether you outline or whether you don't, and how many hours you spend, and, you know, like, do you write linearly, or do you stitch things together, all that sort of thing. And revision, it just depends on what you're doing. Uh, so in this case, I had come up with a term for, for the law, and <laughs> Sorry, I was just kind of thinking about how much of that to explain. But, you know, basically the, yeah, the police force. I tried, I'd come up with a term, and one of my readers, Kelly Robson, thought it wasn't working. Um, and I didn't love it anyway. So she had suggested something else, and it sort of coincided with things that some, that other people had said. Um It's hard to like talk about this without like going all the way into the details. So I'm just going to go ahead and give you, you're going to get details on this story, which I know some of you have been wanting, uh, but you're not going to get enough details to understand. So you're just going to have to live with it. So basically uh, other people have said that like what the law drove would be cool if it was always hounds. And I thought that was cool too. And it, it was kind of in the back of my mind and I, had kind of gone halfway there. So it's like, okay, I'm fully committing to it. It's the law hounds now. And they are, in some ways, literally hounds. That's all I'm going to tell you without explaining the whole premise of the story, which I won't explain now. Uh, so, but because of this, if I have the law hounds, I also had hell hounds, which I wasn't entirely thrilled with anyway because uh, one of the points that Alex had brought up was, what is the role of hell in this world? Which I knew I was going to have to address at some point or another. Uh, it's not entirely true that uh, the existence of hell in a fantasy mythology automatically requires the presence of heaven, but you're going to evoke that polarity in the reader. And in even bringing up heaven and hell brings up a lot of Judeo-Christian ideas. And so, you know, do you want those things in there or not? Um, interestingly enough, I and maybe this is just me, but I think you can have things like demons and devils without necessarily invoking the Judeo-Christian uh, religious hierarchy. Uh, the presence of de devils, I think, does not require the presence of angels. Disagree? Maybe? Yes? Maybe no? Uh, yeah. So I really did think I wanted to take <laughs> hell out of the picture. Don't we always want to take hell out of the picture? So yes, uh, I thought, okay, I really don't want to call them hellhounds. Especially because now I have my law hounds, and I didn't want those things to be conflated and confused. So I had to come up with what this new creature would be. So I kind of went down, I don't want to say a rabbit hole because this was research I needed to do, but you know, looking for like what kind of creature they could be. Uh, and so finally I came up with hell wolves. And, you know, and, and all of these things I do some Googling to see like, are there other media properties that are using these things? Uh, so, in this case, no, not really. There's a, a book that has a wolf named Fell, and that came up as like one of the top searches, and it's from a while back. So, I almost called them dread wolves. I mean, I couldn't call them dire wolves. I kind of went, wanted to go with bears, but I didn't think the bears would work. Uh, I thought dread wolves was too close to dire wolves, and then it turned out to be part of, not, not a gamer, I forget which one, but I can recognize the game name, so it was something like, I don't know, Dragon Age or one of those things. Uh, and one day I should ask George how he decided uh, on dire wolves. It would be interesting to hear it from him, because I wonder if he went through some of the same process. Well, maybe dire wolves were a thing before. Yeah, that's right. It's it. Dire wolves are actually an extinct canine, uh, North American. I did get them in the Libre Tar Pits, which I've been to, and if you haven't, they're super cool. 
so, um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting sort of picking these things out because you have a choice, right? Where you can either try to make something up out of whole cloth with words that are close enough to evoke that image in the reader, uh, or you can pull on an existing mythology. And the problem with pulling on existing mythologies is cultural appropriation. Uh, and then also, well, also cultural appropriation. It's, um, you know, I mean, I talk about this a fair amount. Uh, you know, the, the line that another writer told me a while back, you know, quite a few years back that I found really useful. We are rich because we steal from the best houses. Uh, and, and that is meant in a perfectly genuine, non-plagiarizing sense. You're not taking somebody else's work and pretending that it's yours. But the way that genre canon works, we build upon each other so that we can say that there are things like uh, vampires or werewolves, uh, that kind of thing. Orcs, you know, like everybody uses orcs now, right? Many of you, if you follow this podcast for a long time, know that I'm very interested in uh, how people develop their idea of what the what the origin of a creature is. So, orc, as it's being used today, is directly from Tolkien, uh, from Lord of the Rings. If you go, if you look at the etymology, which I just did, uh, it comes from Latin, which orcus means hell went into Italian, meaning orco, demon monster. Um, in English, orc was a ferocious sea creature. Orc deus in Old English were monsters. In the late 16th century, orc came to mean close to like an ogre. But our current sense is entirely from Tolkien, from Lord of the Rings. Um, Let's see, I'm going to, I wanted to find the exact line here. Uh, so it says, um, the orc was a sort of hell devil or giant in old English literature, and the orc may was a race of corrupted beings and descendants of Cain alongside the elf, according to the poem Beowulf. And I learned yesterday, which I didn't realize before, uh, when I was looking for another name for hellhounds, right? that Beowulf actually means something along the lines of hell wolf. Did you know that? Uh, Tolkien adopted the term orc from these old attest attestations, which he professed was a choice made clear purely for phonetic suitability reasons. So I just think that's really interesting because now orcs are very popular. Uh, the Certainly the whole monster fucking genre um, they love orcs, right? And I wonder how many people realize that they are basically, I don't want to say plagiarizing, but they are taking from the canon that Tolkien created, right? Um, when we talk about vampires, we are taking from the canon that Bram Stoker adapted from oral histories and mythologies, right? So you can argue about who who stole from where, who created what, who made up a thing from whole cloths. Uh, my fell wolves, um, they may become something famous and interesting someday. And then this will be like a seminal historical podcast, right? The moment she came up with it. Well, <laughs> it's probably not that exciting. But still, you know, I pieced that together from existing mythologies in order to create uh, an image, right? To create this monster that would be recognizable and would serve a particular purpose within the story that didn't conflict with other story elements. Um, yeah, so, so that was fun, uh, getting to name those things. So today I'm going to go through because yesterday was all about picking and stitching, 
I need to make sure that it makes cohesive sense still, and I need to pick up anything that I missed. Um, yesterday I talked about ripple effects. These revisions were not ones that would cause massive ripple, ripple effects, but there could be minor ones here and there. Um, one good thing about having crit readers at this point uh, who are really good at picking out inconsistencies was I noticed that the inconsistencies that they pointed to, and they said, well, this kind of conflicts with this part, those are all because that's were sort of where I changed course, where I changed my mind about what the thing would be, um, like what the, how the world worked, um, the course of events, that sort of thing. And it leaves these minor inconsistencies, right? And so they're like, well, why, why is this inconsistency here? Well, that's why. Uh, so now I need to make this pass. I thought maybe I would wait till after Agent Sarah looked at it. She will probably have some edits, but I do the smoothing pass today. And also to work in, um, so it re really just to weave in one more element. Make sure the money makes sense, that I have all the references correct in the various places. But then also to... Yeah, sort of weave in, it's, it's like one more relationship, naming a relationship that I have not previously named, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, that's what I've been busy doing. <laughs> and, and I still didn't talk about book boxes today, did I? You probably don't care. I haven't heard anybody clamoring for me to be talking about book boxes. I will say that uh, I've been reading The Dutch House by Anne Patchett. Um, some of you will recall that Anne Patchett's one of my all-time favorite authors. Uh, well, yes, she is. I love the way she writes. I don't always love her books anymore. I used to say that Anne Patchett was one of the authors that I didn't care what the book was about. Uh, I would just always buy her new release because I wanted to read, I just wanted to read her work and I didn't care what story it was. Uh, and then lately, I have not liked her stories as well. I'm looking over at my uh, my row of Anne Patchett books. Um, but I like The Dutch House. I really enjoy her essays. But I was looking at her books in order. Um, I discovered Anne Patchett uh, before most of you did. So there. A lot of people discovered her with Bel Canto, which is actually her fourth book. Um, I discovered her with her first book, The Patron Saint of Liars, which I found in a bargain bin at my Hastings bookstore in my small town of Laramie, Wyoming. And I picked it up entirely for the title, The Patron Saint of Liars, and bought it on impulse and read it and was enchanted absolutely enchanted and so then I went on to read Taft and the magician's assistant and I caught up to Bel Canto a little bit later um, after I had read Truth and Beauty and Truth and Beauty is nonfiction. it's about her friendship with Lucy Greeley and Lucy Greeley wrote a memoir called uh, Autobiography of a Face and for anyone interested in memoir and nonfiction or in writer's friendships, I absolutely, absolutely recommend reading Autobiography of a Face by Lucy Greeley and then Truth and Beauty by Anne Patchett. Um, they are, your, your life will be changed, especially if you are really interested in that sort of thing. Um, Run, I kind of didn't love and I was surprised that I didn't love it. And then I really didn't like State of Wonder. And so I fell off of Anne Patchett for a while. Uh, and I'm seeing that there's a book called What Now that I never read, or The Bookshop Strikes Back, and Commonwealth. So I really did fall off of her for a while. Uh, but I was intrigued by The Dutch House, which came out in 2019, and I put one of those on searches for it because I didn't want to pay umpty million dollars for the ebook. Uh, sorry, I know, I know. Uh, and so I bought it on sale. And I have just been reading it, and I really do love it. Um, she is such a wonderful writer, and I have a hard time figuring out what makes her writing so 
good. Um, and I'm and I'm interested that she had it divided in the three parts that exactly mimic the three act structure. So I'm you know the act three or part three started right at seventy five percent. And so I'm not sure what I want to say about the Dutch house, except that, yeah, it's it's interesting how she put the story together. I like the way how she has, you know, it's kind of a family history, but she jumbles up the chronology in a way that is recognizable. Um, you know, like, oh, remember that time that we, and fills in all of these little pieces, not necessarily in order. Um I'm interested to see how she lands it. Uh, I haven't, one thing that's very interesting about her books to me is that I never quite know where she's going with the story. Um, Bel Canto, I think, is a little bit of an exception to that because the way, what that story is about has such a predetermined ending. Um, you know it's going to have to end one way or another. Most of her stories, they begin in a place and they wind, and you're not quite sure what they're eventually going to tell. Uh, and this one is like that in a very interesting way. And, it, and I don't know what it, how she does it that she makes me be feel completely comfortable with that. Um, that I don't mind not knowing where the story is going. Whereas I feel like when I'm reading work for other people, that's a frequent criticism. Where I'm like, you know, I just have no idea where we're going. But there's this, I don't know, there's a certain kind of storytelling confidence that is able to pull that off. All right, on that note, uh, I'm going to go um, infuse my story with some confidence. Uh, hope you all have a great Tuesday, and I will talk to you all on Thursday. You all take care, and I'll talk to you.